everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to session three of the Public Policy and Institutional Discrimination Discussion Series, where today's topic is history, reparations, and policy 2.0. And the faculty discussion for today's event is Professor Earl Lewis, who we're very excited to have us to join us today. My name is Stephanie Sanders, and I am the diversity officer and also a lecturer in the Ford School. And this is the third of four sessions of this discussion series. So today's session is co-sponsored by Students of Color in Public Policy. They are also known as SKIP. Uh, and the mission of SKIP is grounded in advocating for the success of all students, including students of color in public policy. So we're exceptionally proud of SKIP's leadership and their collaborative spirit in helping make the Ford School a more inclusive space. And before Emma introduces Professor Lewis, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the goal of the series, as well as the format of today's event. So the goal of the series is to create opportunities for engagement, really for students to get to know faculty and their research beyond the classroom. We continue to hear from students that they are interested in connecting with faculty. And this especially rings true since we're in a remote setting. So this is really another opportunity for students to engage with faculty outside of the classroom. And a second goal of the series is to foster dialogue on important issues of US public policy, like the topic of reparations. Regarding the format for today, uh, Professor Lewis will lead today's discussion. He will speak about the topic for about 30 minutes. And the last 20 minutes of the discussion will be reserved for questions and answers. And during the Q&A portion today, uh, participants are encouraged to make use of the chat box feature, or you can also use the raise hand feature and wait to be recognized so that you can pose a question to Professor Lewis. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Emma Kern Emma is a graduate student in the Ford School of Public Policy, and she's also the communications chair for SKIP. Thank you, Stephanie. So today's faculty discussant is Professor Earl Lewis. Professor Lewis is the Thomas C. Holt Distinguished University Professor of History, Afro-American and African Studies and Public Policy, and the founding director of the U of M Center for Social Solutions. From 2013 to 2018, he served as the president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation. An author and esteemed social historian, he is past president of the Organization of American Historians. A fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the recipient of 11 honorary degrees, he has held faculty and administrative appointments at Michigan and the University of California, Berkeley. From 2004 to 2012, he served as Emory's provost and executive vice president for academic affairs and the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of History and African American Studies. In addition to prior service on a number of nonprofit and governmental boards, Dr. Lewis chairs the Board of Regents at Concordia College, is a trustee of ETS, and a director of 2U and the Capital Group American Funds. Apart from his extensive and impressive resume, I have come to know Professor Lewis as a dedicated educator and compassionate mentor. It is an honor to know him and to continue to learn from him. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Emma, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thanks, thanks to all uh, for attending. I recalled last year uh, at this time uh, where we were sitting in an auditorium and there was food uh, and drink uh, and uh, there was a world uh, before COVID and uh, we were all a part of that world. And so uh, this is an attempt uh, to continue in that conversation. Uh, to, get started and I want to thank Stephanie for inviting me back for 2.0. I realized that when we first talked about 2.0, uh, there were some of you who were in attendance last year, so we we're going to continue that dialogue. But I realized now as we've come a full year, some missed last year's conversation. So let's blend a little bit of 1.0 and 2.0 into a conversation before we head into uh, discussions. So I'm going to try to share my screen. And I really think of this as a conversation about an unjust past and how we connect it to a just future and really moving us toward a conversation about community-based reparations. 
just put it in context, of course, February is Black History Month and uh, Black History Month really began as Black Negro History Week in 1926 and by 1970 had become a month and uh, by the second decade of the 21st century had become globally recognized. Uh, Carter G. Woodson created Black History Week or Negro History Week initially uh, to really offer a correction uh, to the broad assumptions in the academy and beyond that African Americans in particular and people of African descent uh, more globally and generally have made no lasting contributions to human history. Uh, that uh, was known to be untrue uh, by many, um, but it had to be really underscored by an effort. And I say that in part because this brings us to today's topic, reparations. Some of us um, may have recalled an article in the New York Times as part of their 1619 project. And the 1619 project, of course, dealt with the 400th anniversary to commemorate, commemorate uh, African peoples who had been brought uh, first to colonial Jamestown and then uh, to the broader uh, British North America and who were ultimately enslaved. But in that story, we oftentimes think that the story of reparations in and of itself is a story about what transpired uh, from 1619 to 1865. And what Nicole Handler Jones and others wanted to remind us is that no, this story has uh, legs that tr travel well into the 20th century and in fact into the 21st century. And so, I want to anchor this by starting with a story from 1947 in Alabama, the story of Elmore Bowling. It's a gentleman uh, who defied all probability in Longest County, Alabama, by leasing a plantation and where he would go on to uh, then build a general store, a gas station, a catering business. Uh, he came to understand the economics of diversification. And so he grew not just cotton, but corn and sugar cane. He understood that even agricultural uh, pursuits was not enough that he needed to diversify beyond that. So he owned and generated and created a small fleet of trucks that ferried livestock and produce uh, between uh, Londisboro and Montgomery, Alabama. And at its peak in 1947, uh, Bowling actually employed about 40 other people, all of whom were black. That was until a day in December of 1947, uh, when he was approached along a stretch of Highway 80 uh, in Alabama uh, by a group of white guys uh, and they shot him. And they shot him not because he had violated uh, some known statute uh, that he had uh, been accused of any wrong other than the fact that he was deemed to be too successful to be a Negro. And hence they did not want him out of his economic place in a subservient role. Shot six times with a pistol a seventh time with a shotgun, he was left to die on the side of the road. But it was not just the fact that he was executed uh, in this fashion. But at the time of his death, he had about $40,000 in the bank. He had another $5,000 in assets. And he had a total of about $500,000 in today's terms of resources. His neighbors, not satisfied with his death, went about creating a series of uh, credit schemes to actually steal that $40,000 in the bank uh, to confiscate uh, the other real assets and to force his family uh, to flee the area uh, within three years of this murder to in, in effect dispossess them of all that they had claimed and had earned. It was these stories, the stories of slavery, the stories of Jim Crow South, the stories of the ways uh, that African Americans have been uh, in, had to endure unjust past that led the late John Conyers, who was a congressman, as many of you know, from Detroit here in Michigan, uh, to propose a bill uh, in 1988 uh, that became known as H.R. 40. That bill would come before Congress for almost 30 years. Is today uh, being led by Sheila Jackson Lee, a Democrat from Texas, who has taken up the mantle after John uh, left uh, Congress and, uh, and after he died. Last year, there were 125 co-sponsors of H.R. 40. As of yesterday, there were 173 co-sponsors of H.R. 40. That is 173 of the 221 Democratic members of the House of Representatives. That's was true last year, as was true the year before, as was true the year before that, 
all of the co-sponsors were Democrats. There are none to this day of the 211 Republicans have elected uh, to co-sponsor this legislation. But as you recall, and for those who know the story, of course, HR 40 calls for a commission to study the whole idea of reparations. It does not call for reparations outright, but a commission to study. This call to, for reparations has a long history in the US. In fact, it actually goes back to the colonial period, but it gained even more um, steam and energy after the Civil War. Started in part by a whole land redistribution scheme that emerged along the Sea Islands of Georgia and South Carolina in Port Royal, South Carolina in particular, where Sherman uh, issued a special order that gave land to the formerly enslaved who was still inhabiting the land uh, during, uh, in times of the Civil War. It also came to include Mon Bayou uh, in lands in and around Davison Bend, Mississippi, which had been owned by Jefferson Davis. So that period of land redistribution, uh, although it was short lived, uh, was an important chapter because it was in that period that the idea of 40 acres and a mule, which has sort of grabbed hold and in some ways is linked to the idea of HR 40, uh, really gain uh, some permanent public traction. But for African Americans coming out of the Civil War, it was not just enough to talk about land redistribution because they realized this all turned upon a willing government uh, to enforce it. And then after the Port Royal experiment, uh, really the government shied away from redistributing land to the formerly enslaved and in large measure uh, after a series of loyalty oaths redistributed the land or, or to the formal, former Confederate uh, soldiers who had fought against the Union. And so as a result, men and women such as Callie House uh, decided that they needed to do something more. Callie House had herself been enslaved in Tennessee and she helped to form something called the Ex-Slave Mutual Relief, Bounty and Pension Association. She and her colleagues region, reasoned that if the US government could figure out a pension plan and grant it to form in union, union soldiers, they should, could also come up with a pension plan for uh, the former African-Americans who had been enslaved. And so in fact, they used then the soldiers pension plan as a model and calling for a government contribution. Now, Callie House uh, and others who made this argument uh, had to win over supporters, of course. Frederick Douglass, the noted abolitionist, was at one point in opposition uh, to the idea of financial reparations. But in time, he would come to argue that just as it was in Egypt and certainly was true in Russia, and that it was a, there was a need for African-Americans to also be provided with some assistance. And as he notes here, but the Negro has neither spoils, implements, nor land. And today he is practically a slave on the very plantation where formerly he was driven to toil under the, lab, under the lash. What Douglas is inferring to is in fact that uh, there was the end of enslavement, but with it came no assurances of food, of clothing, of tools, or other resources and assets that would make for an easier transition into freedom and that this needed to be addressed. While Douglas came to align himself with Callie House and others, that wasn't true of all African-American leaders at the end of the Civil War heading into the end of the 19th century. Republican congressmen, uh, Cheatham, Miller, and Langston from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia respectively, all of whom were black, supported education and voting rights over financial reparations. They would argue that the former education and voting rights would ensure that subsequent generations would be equally prepared uh, to advance in competition with others. Interestingly, and there were some Southern whites who actually came to believe that a capitalized black population could help restore the financial fortunes of the South. And so they would actually come to champion financial repar reparations. An example that I noted last year and I offer again here is that of Walter Vaughn and William Connell. 
Vaughn uh, was the former editor of the Omaha Daily Democrat. And Connell, who was his congressman, uh, introduced legislation in 1890. And so a quarter of a century after uh, the end of the Civil War with the following formula, where he would think in a graduated way that a combination of age uh, and, and all would contribute to how much you would pay. So $15 per month and a $500 one-time payment for each ex-slave who was 70 years and older. If, we, if you were under 70, and then you would receive a $300 one-time payment, $1,200 per month until 70. And then that would be increased by $3 to the $15 per month allotment. And that continued until uh, you had another scheme if you were 60 and under 60. But it was this idea that there would be some recognition and you know, that people had endured, had suffered, uh, and should be compensated uh, for years of uncompensated labor. And in this notion, there was a symbiotic relationship that was sort of underscored. The Southern whites believed that African Americans who have financial means would be contributing members to the overall revitalization of the Southern economy. And this would redound to the benefit of the individuals, but also uh, to everyone else in their midst. These earlier efforts, particularly as we look at them from the vantage point of 2021, leads to fundamental questions about what is meant by reparations, especially today. William Sander Darity and Kirsten Mullen in their recently published book, which just came out last year, from here to equality, try to offer a definition. According to them, reparations amount to a program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure for grievous injustice. A program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure for grievous injustice. And by acknowledgement, they're trying to actually underscore and highlight a couple of points. Is here that the core of it is recognition and admission of a wrong. It's not enough to just say there was a wrong, but public recognition and admission of a wrong. By redress, they argue that there has to be some form both of either restitution or atonement. Restitution or atonement. And they argue that you can only get to the final stage of closure when the injured and those who benefited agree on this mutual conciliation. So for Sanidarity and Kirsten Mullen, then it's the ARC, is reparations. That is acknowledgement, redress, and closure. And it is indeed a program, a dedicated program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure. Which is interesting because last year at this time, when you asked the average American about reparations, particularly as it related to slavery. 74% of African Americans said, yes, reparations uh, were important. 85% of whites said, no, they would not support reparations. Those numbers haven't moved much in the intervening year. And in part, it always turns on the issues of who benefits, who pays, who is responsible? What's meant here by reparations? And how much is enough? I mean, some economists and others have estimated that if you really began to try to itemize uh, and come up with a number, we're talking in the range of the upper end of $16 trillion just for those descendants of individuals who were enslaved. And that excludes the Jim Crow era and all that followed thereafter. 16 trillion. So who benefits, who pays, who is responsible, what's meant, how much is enough becomes part of the ongoing challenge. And that seemed to be where we were until last uh, spring, summer, and a series of racial protests that pulled us all back into the vortex of a world where we came to understand in that racial injustice and a past that is unjust has implications for our present 
in our future. That helped to remind many that the United States has indeed had moments where it actually could answer the question and where reparations were offered either at the individual or group level. In the 19th century, Harriet, I mean, Henrietta Wood, as detailed in Caleb McDaniel's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Sweet Taste of Liberty, became the only African American man or woman that we can find who really uh, was received some restitution through the courts because of being enslaved. Henrietta Wood, who had been born into slavery, who would gain her freedom, live in Cincinnati as a free woman of color, who would then be stolen back into slavery, sent from Kentucky to Mississippi and ultimately uh, Texas, uh, who would then, at the end of a 10 year travail of trauma and abuse, uh, would come out of the end of the Civil War and then sue her captor and ultimately win. It came a singular story about an individual as we look at the story of reparations in American history. There's, of course, the example of Native Alaskans as Alaska was seeking to become a state in the Union that negotiated uh, with the federal government and arguing that things had to be resolved before Alaska could be formally admitted and certain lands could be used for oil drilling. And in that case, Native Alaskans were able to retain 16% of the land mass of Alaska, which is two and a half times the size of Texas, or about 44 million acres. And they were given about $1 billion and what uh, initially was 12 corporations, which now more like seven corporations uh, were created. And of course, more of us know of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 uh, and the decision to finally compensate Japanese American survivors of internment uh, during World War II with $20,000 each. Each story has its own depths and complexities. But the events of last summer put a spotlight on those moments in which uh, the country came to some resolution, either through the courts or through legislative action. Recently, the center I direct, the Center for Social Solutions uh, here at the University of Michigan, uh, received a $5 million grant uh, from the Mellon Foundation. And part of that grant uh, is to begin to uh, use a community-based approach to think about reparations. And where higher education institutions then that are geographically situated and tied to local communities can play a role. This builds on work out of Evanston, Illinois. A few years ago, Evanston decided that it needed to investigate its own racial history and racial past. And as part of that investigation, it came to realize that it had played a disproportionate role in um, stripping African Americans in most instances and Latinas and Latinos and other instances of access uh, to a whole range of things from housing and education uh, to the ability to pursue their lives fruitfully. They especially took note of earlier attempts to uh, essentially uh, steal land and property from African Americans in Evanston. Uh, and also the ways in which the criminal justice system have been mobilized during the war on crime and particularly its focus on drugs uh, to really overstate the degree to which African Americans and Latinos and Latinas actually were responsible uh, for this, this scourge of drugs. And so in the result, the city council ruled that as they came to legalize marijuana, they should use some of the proceeds from the legalization uh, to identify, prioritize, and quantify uh, individuals for, among other things, restorative housing reparations. Um, but actually thinking through what it meant to think through restorative justice more broadly across the city of Evanston. And so while Sheila Jackson Lee and others are talking for a federal solution to all of this. We began to see in the last few years, a new trend, which is community-based. 
Evanston is one example. Asheville, North Carolina is the second example. The state of California, where um, governor has issued now a uh, call for a statewide examination of reparations in the state of California is yet a third example. It's saying that we may find ourselves in a moment not unlike in the civil rights movement, where community-based action helped to shape and define and spur federal action. And that indeed federal action only came because of actions taken at the community level. At least that's the assumption that has guided our grant. And so our grant is called Crafting Democratic Futures, situating colleges and universities in community-based reparation solutions. And it involves a cluster of liberal arts colleges, major research universities spanning uh, from Minnesota in the West uh, to Emory and Spelman uh, in the South and Southeast. And the goal among each uh, is uh, to really do three things. One is to say that universities as in colleges as anchor institutions are going anywhere and have an inherent responsibility for the welfare of the community and the regions that it's part of. That two, that there are local histories that need to be crafted about uh, questions of reparations. And then three, those local histories can't be written by those of us in universities and colleges alone. They require the careful development and curation of those uh, who live in those communities. And so as a result, this is a community-based partnership that we have are developing. The grant just started on the first of, or second of January. And so we're in the developmental stage uh, for sure. As part of this grant, we aim to do several things. One, we want to identify in each of those communities, uh, I, not only community partners, but an individual or individuals we call community fellows. These are individuals who themselves were community activists who will help um, the universities and colleges in real time, in real ways uh, to write those histories that themselves will be crowdsourced. Two, we imagine that the products that we will produce would then be shared with legislative uh, and other bodies and that will be able to turn um, what we do into would be policy. Now, the, my friends at the Mellon Foundation keep reminding me that we're not uh, able to lobby and I assure them, I understand that, um, but I also understand we are able to educate. Uh, and so we will mount a powerful educational effort. One partner I haven't mentioned to thus far is WQED, the public radio and television station out of Pittsburgh. WQED is our media partner. And their job is to not only track and chronicle what happens in each of these communities, but also in the end to help to produce a documentary and that will be aired on public television and that begins to talk about the ways in which the idea of reparations takes hold, that chronicles both the successes and failures, that highlights the ways in which this either taps into a pulse for change and recognition and resolution and restitution, or taps into a pulse of opposition and recrimination, because both need to be discovered and uncovered if we actually are going to move to through the stages of the acknowledgement uh, leading to closure that uh, is called for um, by uh, Sandy Darity and, and Kirsten Mullen. I want to end, and so we have some time uh, to really have a conversation with the case of Elmo Bowen. The other night I was giving a talk about this project uh, to a group in, in Pennsylvania, uh, mostly individuals who live in a retirement home. And invariably, uh, one of the questions was raised is saying, you know, what do you say to those whose parents and grandparents uh, say uh, they were part of the wave of European immigrants who came to the United States in the early 20th century uh, and had a no bearing on the story of slavery? And I say, I hear you. 
And that's why I started the story with the case of Alma Bowling. Because the story of reparations is not just a story about enslavement. It's a story about Jim Crow. It's a story about the federal government uh, and its policies of redlining and all that have led to vast racial wealth differences in the United States. It's a story that was highlighted just two days ago in the media, the black family in Texas uh, that had his home appraised and they thought the appraisal was extraordinarily low. And so they had uh, white neighbors uh, come in the next time the appraiser came and discovered that the appraisal jumped by $500,000 when the face uh, of the owner went from black to white. And that in some ways, the story of reparations is not defined just by the institution of slavery, but the legacy of the institution of slavery still has its fingers and tentacles around a whole lot and that is embedded in American history. Uh, into this day. And so what we want to do both in the project that we're working on is ask, how do you actually deal with each moment? And what is each moment in American history in all of its geographic variability? Tell us about how we go about acknowledgement, redress, if our aim is closure. It seems striking and important that in this month, of Black history, that we pause and we reflect on what strategies are required if our goal really is closure. Or <clears throat> we can continue to go along. And I end with one little, with a little story, right? Because in the last two years, there have been high profile comments by uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, who was saying he was opposed to reparations because there was no one who have been involved in the institution of slavery, who is alive today. And then there was a comment by David Brooks in a series of articles in the New York Times, who said that that too had been his initial interpretation and impression. But as he's traveled America and continued to see the ways in which the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow shaped opportunities in the 21st century, he's come to realize that we have to address in some formal way the whole question of reparations if we're ever to get beyond and move forward as a nation. And, and I think that is a question that we all have to pose for ourselves as we get uh, in, begin to exit the month of February, move into the month of March, month of March, March, April, May, and June. Do we want closure? Are we prepared to actually continue to come back to this same question over and over and over again? It seems the momentum is moving in a certain direction. We hope that momentum doesn't require the death of another George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or others to make it more salient for the majority of Americans. So let me stop there uh, as a teaser uh, to begin a conversation and um, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lewis, for providing us with an overview of the contemporary calls for reparations, for outlining who's been involved in the process, uh, for talking about the role of education, if we are to move, in your words, uh, toward closure, and for speaking about it in a global context as a matter of important social policy. So for the remainder of the session, we'll open it up for uh, a few discussion for questions for Professor Lewis. And as a reminder, participants can make use of the chat box or the raise hand feature, and um, I will recognize you so you can pose the question to Professor Lewis. Go ahead, Mariam. Hi, Professor Lewis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your work, your expertise, um, and just your own career path through this work. It's really important. Um, I took class with you last semester, or two semesters now ago, 
um, and I learned a lot. And something that you mentioned in this in this um, series and then also in class is just how many variations and meanings the word reparations holds. And I guess my question for you, and it's a very broad and general question, but I'm wondering how do we move forward um, as a united front when this term means so many different things to so many different people? Yeah, uh, it's great to see you. I hope you're doing well. And um, now you asked a very, very important question, uh, which is that it is difficult uh, to think through its rep reparations. Are we talking about financial reparations? Uh, are we talking about educational opportunities? Are we talking about voting rights? Are we talking about, and you sort of fill in the blank. And in some ways, the project that we've just launched uh, through the Mellon Grant is actually designed to uncover answers to that question. Um, what we decided we didn't want to do was to tell people exactly what should be meant by reparations. And so if you go to the farthest west school in our network is Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. So Moorhead is literally right across the river, three minutes away from Fargo, North Dakota. It's the Red River uh, goes through. And there are a number of Native American communities that go from Western and Northern Minnesota and, and uh, Eastern uh, North Dakota down to South Dakota and, and Iowa. And so Concordia, for instance, is asking a question about reparations as a, uh, in partnership with Native American communities. Uh, and so that's a different story. The timeline is different. Uh, the conditions are different. Uh, and so what we want to be able to do is to uh, argue that a community-based approach to reparations may require us to do something that is even more uncomfortable and then coming up with a national strategy which is to go into the communities and ask, where were those moments of injustice that was systematized that need to be uh, addressed, redressed, uh, certainly acknowledged and redressed uh, before you can bring closure? If you think of <clears throat> North Dakota as an example right now, you're trying to figure out um, the, the pipeline. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it's almost impossible to talk about uh, contemporary politics in North Dakota without talking about oil in the pipeline and why it was moved from Bismarck to where it is on, on native lands uh, and what the implications are. Uh, so those are the kinds of examples, which is different than if we go to Newark, uh, which is another institution, uh, Rutgers Newark, uh, which has had a long history of dealing with restitution, if not reparations uh, in Newark uh, and the symbiotic relationship between the university, Rutgers uh, University, Newark, uh, and the city uh, there. I mean, that's a complicated question. But if you think about it, almost every land grant public institution in the United States uh, was created as a result of confiscation, confiscation of lands that have been owned by native peoples. How do you begin to think about reparations and what are reparations in that context? Um, or um, use Georgetown as an example. You know, uh, the history recently that uh, the Jesuit order in and around Maryland secured the future of Georgetown in part by uh, selling 272 African uh, descended peoples in farther south into Louisiana and using those proceeds to both show up the order and to advantage the institution. What would reparations, what should reparations look like uh, if the center focus is Georgetown University? And as we talked about last year in class, uh, it's one thing for Georgetown as it has done uh, to promise access to a Georgetown education to anyone who can gain admission uh, to Georgetown who was part of that original family of 272. But then when the student body decided to tax itself uh, to for $400,000 a year, how small that seemed to the descendants when they just sort of did the arithmetic and try to figure out $400,000 divided by 3,000 people, what does that get us? Uh, and so that leads to a whole different conversation about reparations, three different sites, three different institutions, in this case, all higher ed institutions with different kinds of stories uh, to tell. And I think part of our work ahead is actually unearthing uh, some parts of those stories uh, to think about the implications of a community-based solution in addition to a federal solution. Go ahead, Tia. 
Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much for Pro Professor Lewis. I'm wondering for a while now, um, at least I think since Hillary Clinton's loss, there's been a lot of talk amongst pundits that class-based policies and retribution um, and redistribution are a political winner, but that race and identity um, is unfortunately less, like much less popular and even a political loser. Um, so I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how to make reparations more popular among the general electorate and then also on the morality and the um, efficiency of using income-based or wealth-based redistribution as sort of like a proxy. Yeah, so that's, that's a very complicated question. Let me see if I can pull it apart. Um, but thank you for that question. Uh, and and um, I mean, one thing I would end up saying is that people are never one thing. They never did black or white. Uh, uh, and so as you sort of think of the whole person and they sit across a spectrum of identities uh, that talk about their class and their race and gender and their religious and their political beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. And so part of the challenge when we get into the political domain is that sometimes we highlight one or two of those variables without thinking about their intersectionality uh, and asking questions there. But I would argue in this case, uh, at the very least, a starting point has to be race. And, and, and I don't always argue that. I, I've written a number of articles and books about intersectionality and, and the need to do uh, deal with the ways in which race and class and all these things sort of interact with one another. But I fear that um, if we don't tackle the racial dimension here, we will always find ourselves in a sort of loop coming back to the start. Uh, and I worry that as a nation, particularly as we move toward 2040 and 2045, when we will have a non-white majority uh, for the first time uh, in all of American history. That is to say, there have been places that had non-white majorities, Mississippi in the 1860s, uh, South Carolina in the 1790s uh, had uh, non-white majorities, but the nation is projected uh, will have a non-white majority. We get to that point without addressing the whole question of our own racial history of injustice means then that we'll second half of the 21st century, we'll be starting back in the same places that we ended the 20th century with and that we muddled our way through the first three or four decades of the 21st century. So I push us to have the courage to believe that we can actually engage in uh, this uh, forward moving uh, effort. And if you think of it this way, and, and guided by, by family and friends who says, you know, um, the challenge is to remind ourselves that by the, by the middle of the 21st century, America will look like uh, the rest of the world, um, where folks who have been defined as minorities in the 20th century will be recognized as part of the global majority uh, in the second half of the 21st century. Uh, and that shift in language from minority to global majority uh, begins to say something about the axis of power. It's more important, I think, to actually begin and work through all of this now. So does that mean, to, to, to your question, does that mean that every African-American should benefit in the same way? No, it's the same way that I shouldn't be receiving benefits right now uh, from the federal government uh, for people who have been, who lost their jobs and need assistance. Uh, there should be some means testing in some places and on a certain term. Um, but it's also the case that uh, we know that wealth, which is different than income, is not evenly distributed uh, across the United States and it's not even evenly distributed within a black family uh, and household. And so there's enough sociological literature on the fact of the probability of African-Americans who are upper middle class and, uh, and all being able to actually extend that to successive generations. And the probability for them is much lower than it is for white Americans. And so if, if we start saying it's only about class and ignore those racial realities, we never get through the redress that can lead to the closure. Judy, I think is next. Hi, Professor. Hi, Judy. Long time no see. Um, <laughs> so my question is, I'm curious, you, you're using the word closure and closure to me feels very finite, like you're done, you do it and you're done. And I, this feels like a very multifaceted 
issue, I'm curious, like, do you think there's just, we have one shot to do this and if we don't make it work right, it's over? Or do we th do you think there's, we have some chances? That's a very good question. And so I'm, I'm building on Sandy's and, and Kirsten's notion of closure and full disclosure, Judy is in my class and we'll be talking about this in full detail in the next uh, few weeks. And so um, I think we have one attempt to do this in a way that satisfies the majority of people. Uh, and I don't know that, they, <laughs> I dare say there's not, there, there are few examples in, in human history, let alone American history, where a, a policy edict or a decision, legislative decision has satisfied everyone forever. Uh, and in part, uh, there, you can look at the litany of lawsuits uh, and other kinds of activities to suggest that how often and that has not been the case. Um, but and my sense is, is that there is a window of opportunity uh, and, uh, and that window of opportunity will not remain open uh, forever. And the consequences of failing to seize that opportunity means that we find ourselves yet once again, going back into communities where we're squaring off against one another uh, for limited resources. Uh, and I think this will, I worry, I don't know, if, I worry that this will be heightened in the next two decades as we come to terms with the massive restructuring of labor and that, it, that I can foresee happening uh, as automation continues to expand uh, and his whole job families themselves are altered. And so if you layer on this sense that my loss is not the same as your loss uh, and uh, what you're asking me to give up is something that uh, then forfeits my right to do something else. My worry is if we don't get to it in the next 10 years, it will be drowned out by other kinds of macroeconomic changes uh, that, and the political consequences that we'll be facing as a nation and a world uh, over the next quarter of a century. Uh, and uh, that could be devastating for all. We'll get to talk about more of this in the next couple of weeks. So um, I see a lot of hands. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. And the next hand that I saw come up was Sam Hurd. Yeah, thank you, Professor Lewis, for this talk. This was um, incredibly insightful. Um, I guess I had a question sort of specifically about HR 40 and your thoughts on it in terms of one critique that I hear from supporters of reparations on HR 40 is that there doesn't need to be like another study of how it would be done and that there's been a number of academic studies that have mapped out different ways that it could be paid out and that HR 40, while certainly more positive than the current status quo, um, is still in effect potentially like kicking the can down the road and not actually leading towards an actual policy change. And so I was just curious what your thoughts are on that are and whether HR 40 is sort of more of a necessary like political step um, to build support from like a congressionally mandated study. Yeah, I actually think it's probably, I uh, thank you for that question. I think it's probably more the latter uh, that indeed there have been a series of studies that can outline uh, what needs to be done. But what HR 40, I think represents is a socialization effort. Uh, to begin to socialize uh, those solutions, both at the congressional level, uh, but also at the national level. And, and the question is here for me, it's almost a matrix, right? I mean, uh, by reparations, are we only talking about financial reparations? And so we're we talking about money uh, in the, I mean, the upper end of 16 trillion uh, that uh, some have projected. Are we talking about workforce opportunities? Uh, are we talking about investment and co-investment? In, uh, in neighborhoods and communities across the country. I mean, I think what, what a commission could do is actually begin to delineate uh, with some specificity what, and going back to that earlier question, what we mean by reparations is A, B, C, and D. Here's how we will begin to actually uh, implement in that kind of rollout, that X number, I'm, I'm making this up, right? X million trillions of dollars would go uh, for this and X billions of dollars would go for this, and these new zones would go, and here's the accountability index. And so, and then some of, someone is watching this to make sure it ends up where it's supposed to be going. I mean, uh, as Emma knows, one of the things we're trying to do in the center is come up with a reparations index right now uh, to begin uh, for all of those corporations that claim they were giving monies uh, to 
these groups are coming out of the George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor murders, among others. Who's tracking that? I mean, right now there's there's public facing positive uh, pieces that are going on, but there's no way to be held accountable. And so we would need to make sure that HR 40 commission would talk about not only then what's reparations, what we would end up paying, but then who's actually going to be held accountable and how do we as a public hold them accountable to make sure resources if that's there are getting to where they need to be. So I think that work still has to be done. So thank you so much, Professor Lewis, for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Thank you for, for uh, participating and for uh, posing some really insightful questions. Uh, so this will end uh, today's event. We will host our final discussion on March the 11th with faculty discussant uh, Roderick Johnson, and he will lead us in a discussion on lobbying and mass incarceration. So hopefully you'll be able to join us during this time. Thank you again. This concludes today's events. Thank you.